This is Sarah Meixel with PigSight, and today we're here with Peter Longendike. He is a senior research scientist with Trow Nutrition. Peter's worked with Trow for seven years, focusing on sow R&D, looking specifically at how nutrition um, can play a role in sow performance. Prior to his work at Trow Nutrition, he conducted sow research in Australia at a public R&D institution. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today, Peter. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Let's get right to it, Peter. Tell me a little bit about why piglets are dying during farrowing. Okay, the average uh, litter in sows nowadays uh, probably uh, contains some, uh, something like 18 piglets in uh, high prolific sows. So during the farrowing process, all these piglets have to move from where they are positioned in the uterus. Um, all the way to the cervix, and that, that's where they are expelled. Um, so the, the piglets are positioned um, like in a line in the two uterine horns, the left and the right uterine horn. Um, so the ones, and they are expelled exactly in the, in the sequence that they are positioned in the uterus. So the ones that come out first are uh, probably the ones that are positioned uh, close to the cervix. Um, whereas a piglet that is positioned at the very end of the uterine horn, close to the ovary, will be the one to be born last. So um, if we are talking a litter of 18 piglets, there'll be um, roughly nine on each side, uh, nine in the left and nine in the right uterine right. horn. Um, but to, to give birth to all these piglets, that may take a while. Um, so the piglets that are sitting at the end of the, uh, of the uterine horn, will have to wait until, you know, uh, the end of the farrowing process to be born. And all that time, this piglet will experience uterine contractions. Um, those contractions obviously serve to, to push the piglets towards the cervix where they are born. Um, but what they also do is that they squeeze the piglet and more importantly, the placenta um, that the piglet is attached to. And this placenta uh, supplies nutrients, but also oxygen to the piglet. But every time a contraction passes along the uterine horn and squeezes the placenta, the oxygen supply to that particular piglet is uh, compromised uh, or even inhibited for as long as the contraction lasts. Um, so if, for example, a farrowing process takes five hours, the piglet that's born last will have to go through that uh, process for five hours. And um, that, that will have a cumulative effect on the piglet. And the piglet will experience a reduction in, in, in oxygen supply um, for, for uh, temporary, um, you know, temporarily when there is a contraction. Um, but over the five hours, that will have a cumulative effect uh, on the piglet. And by the time it's born, um, it will have signs of what we call asphyxia, uh, so oxygen insufficiency. And they are evident from a low blood pH, so the blood acidifies, uh, and high lactate levels. Um, those piglets are compromised. Um, it's a condition that can, uh, can recover to some extent, but there's also long-term damage um, uh, from Great. asphyxia. Hmm. And um, so those long-term effects are evident from, for example, uh, mortality. We see that piglets that are born in the second half of the litter, um, so at the end of the farrowing process, have yeah. a higher chance of for neonatal mortality. Um, they also have a compromised gain through lactation, but even after weaning, um, up to the point where they are slaughtered, um, their gain is still lower than piglets that don't have signs of um, asphyxia. So what can producers really do to manage this farrowing process and kind of have fewer piglet deaths? Uh, so um, it simply comes down to how we can uh, shorten the farrowing process because that's the key issue. Um, um, and that comes to uh, stress, uh, stress caused by housing, um, stress caused by nutrition, and stress caused by uh, handling of the sows. So if I start with housing, we know that, for example, housing sows in crates where they cannot move around, where they cannot uh, perform nest building behavior. We know that um, as effects on oxytocin, 
And oxytocin is exactly the hormone that's responsible for controlling contractions and speeding up the ferrying process. So if we can uh, optimize housing conditions and uh, improve oxytocin secretion, we can shorten the, the ferrying process. Um, uh, another source of stress is a nutritional stress, um, is uh, for example, the transition diets. Uh, diets that are low in fiber can cause constipation. Uh, constipation is, uh, is painful for sounds and uh, that pain is another source of stress. So if we can provide a transition diet that improves um, constipation, then at least we can avoid that source of stress. And we know from research that that shortens the uh, farrowing process and improves the number of stillborn. Um, the last and third one is the handling of sows. Uh, there's been some nice publications uh, where sows were moved during the farrowing process something you wouldn't normally do, but that kind of research uh, demonstrated um, that when you handle sows in that way during the farrowing process, oxytocin again goes down and the farrowing process is prolonged. Um, and uh, an example of the similar kind of handling stress is when we palpate sows during the farrowing process, when we actually try to help sows by pulling out piglets, um, we think we help the sow, but I would like to question whether we really do. Uh, we may also provide a stressor to the sows and compromise the rest of the farrowing process. Mm. There are indications um, from our own data, but also from some studies in the field, where it was demonstrated that actually reducing um, the amount of interventions during the farrowing process uh, can actually help the sow and uh, reduce the number of uh, stillborn. That's interesting uh, because you producers obviously think they're helping the process, as you said, but they might actually be, um, you know, be causing additional stress, it sounds like. Yes, that's, uh, that's the case. And uh, in some cases, it's probably helpful to, to, to intervene during the farrowing process, uh, especially when piglets are obstructing the birth canal. Um, but I, I would say that uh, in, the num in the large number of cases, it probably doesn't really help. And, and um, I think people always want to do something. They want to, um, you know, they want action and that's understandable. Um, but if you look and right. the interval between two piglets is often the guideline to, um, to start intervening. And when the interval between piglet exceeds 30 minutes, that's a general rule of thumb to start intervening. But uh, if you look at our research data, the interval between piglets is really a poor indicator of, um, of whether the farrowing process is compromised. Mm -hmm. um, so if that interval is 30 minutes, I wouldn't really worry. Um, we've seen uh, stillbirth only go up when that interval is really way beyond an hour. Oh, okay. um, so I think that interval is, is, a, is a poor indicator. I think whether you start intervening or not, um, should be based more on how long the sow has been farrowing in total. So if she's been farrowing for two hours, I wouldn't really worry about uh, unless she's showing obvious signs of distress. But if the farrowing process has been going on for say four hours, that's when I would really start to uh, think and, uh, and maybe decide to intervene, um, but not based on interval uh, between piglets. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all that information, Peter. Very appreciative. Um, I hope we can do this again. Uh, I hope we can do this again soon because this is really uh, great information. No problem. Thanks for having me. This is Sarah Meisel with the Pig Site.